Hello, everyone. My name is Lou Zaccarella. I'm one of the founders of the Intelligent Community Forum. The ICF, as many of you know, is a think tank dedicated to studying ways to make our homes, cities, towns, regions, and villages better. One of our areas of focus is how broadband and other access technologies enable economic and social growth. And we've been trying to explore that with a range of programs and research and uh, interviews with thought leaders around the world. Right now, we're going to start a new series of interviews with uh, our visionaries and people around the world who really have a, an understanding of the relationship between broadband and economic and social growth. Our theme this year for this new series is Revolution to Renaissance. And I'll briefly explain what that means. We have begun to believe at ICF that smart is not enough, that having smart meters, that having the technology infrastructure is where you start this whole journey into becoming uh, a community that people want to live in and stay in and thrive in. But there's a whole other element to it, one that needs to be planned for, although in many ways it's decidedly nonlinear, and that's what we call the intelligent piece of this. So that's the intelligent in the intelligent community. So we're moving from revolution, which is obviously the technology, to a renaissance, which is an enlightening now of the human mind, the human potential, and trying to mine that to make, again, the kind of places that we want to live in. So with that, uh, I can't do this thinking by myself, certainly. We've asked our senior fellow, ICF's first senior fellow, Dr. Norman Jackness, to come in and to have a conversation about this theme today. So, Norm, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to have you here. I want to just, I'm going to jump right into this because, again, it's a, it's a pretty meaty subject. But, you know, you always remind us that broadband is not enough, that while many places now have connectivity, many are not really planning for their future with it. They're putting it in, they're financing it, they're even arguing over it, but not really planning for it. For those who, you know, who are listening to this, who are planning communities and trying to get their pieces together, what's the most common misperception about the planning, funding, and implementation of broadband that, that you're observing out there in the field? I think, I think, frankly, the most common mistake is thinking that um, just putting the fiber in the ground is sufficient. Um, and uh, and just to your point about an intelligent city versus uh, um, only a smart city, uh, because first of all, you put, put, can put fiber in the ground, and if people don't use it, uh, then they're not going to get any value from it. Uh, you know, this is a problem that service providers call the adoption problem. So they'll say that we pass by everybody's house, but they're not using it. And so one of the things you need to do as a leader in a city is to think about how is this technology going to be used for larger community goals, uh, for health, for economic development, for education, uh, and start getting those things going. Um, and mm -hmm. and it's, uh, you know, it's really important to, that the leaders not only help get these things going, but they explain to their followers, to the residents of their city, um, what this is all about and how they can use it themselves. Yeah. And, and, and I just want to add one other thing about sure. this, because because one of the other things that I mistakes that I see is people think of well we'll have broadband and that's great, and then they continue to think of their city as being the same old city it was before there was a broadband. And in other words, they they don't realize that they're now connected globally. They're not helping their residents become global members of a global economic community and taking advantage of all those kind of opportunities. Yeah, and and that's that's a real good point because. Um, you know, you go to these places, especially in, in the post-industrial hangover era, and, you know, it, the big factory, the big company left town, and they've been waiting 20 years for it or something like it to return. And that's kind of the image they have in their head, that if they get this, quote, intelligent and smart stuff right, the new company uh, will come back to town and, and be the mother ship again. But that that's probably not what's going to happen. They, I don't think they can plan for that, can they? No, they can't. First of all, it's very hard. Uh, and, and the reality is there are all kinds of – once you've got that connectivity uh, and you, you so you're connecting people to the global economy, they have all sorts of opportunities that they didn't have before that happened. So they don't need that big plan. In fact, you, uh, one of the things uh, that having this connectivity and melding it into your economic development strategy does is it reduces your risk and your dependence on a single major employer. 
Right. Exactly. So you build a hedge for yourself. Um, you know, I, I said earlier also, and you're alluding to it, this is nonlinear stuff. I mean, this is not like, you know, planning a, a railroad or, you know, again, a, ro a road or something like that. This is to plan for a knowledge workforce does require a, an almost a quantum movement of, of the economy and planning, right? So uh, the new blue collar laborer is going to be a knowledge worker, but that still seems to be a stretch for a lot of the planners and leadership to, to grasp, much less communicate. Um, I mean, what, what can we do to sort of overcome that and make it clearer and to put them on a path that, you know, reminds them that there's a lot of uncertainty in this, and yet there is a way to, to go ahead with it? Well, I, I think there, there are a couple aspects. First of all, you know, you've, you're pointing out that, that it's not just – this is not just for computer programmers. There are all kinds of people who are in blue-collar jobs or even low-tech jobs – uh, that can benefit from this. And, you know, I've, I've talked about this in some of my presentations. Uh, some of the most interesting stories are people, you know, like this, the story of, of the, the lobsterman's wife who ended up using the Internet. But you can't think of anything more low-tech than knitting a lobster bait bag. But, the, but that connectivity helped them flourish. Right. So, so there's that. First thing they need to understand is this yeah, is, they put it on the internet. They're they, able to sell product. They're, they're able to sell product and actually sell it in new ways they hadn't even thought about before yeah. beyond lobster bait bags. And I think that the that, but so that's what's really important here is is for the leaders who are uh, running these projects not just to think oh this is going to help me keep some programmers here. It's much more than that. Uh, I think the other thing is. That what if you're a leader of a community, and we're talking now about the future economy here and the kinds of people who will be driving that economy, uh, unfortunately, in most situations, local civic leaders hear from the established uh, people, the, the people who've won under the old economic rules, not who are winning under the new rules. So they really have to go out of their way to meet the, the entrepreneurs, the people who are in, in co-working spaces and hackathons and all that who are building that new economy. Uh, and and that will and, and having a good conversation with those people will help them figure out how to move forward. Yeah, Norm, does it uh, does it happen organically? I mean, I know, yeah. You know, there's there's a there's a an article. There's a dispute going on in New York where where I live about the pedestrian plazas along 42nd Street. And I, I just use that as sort of a rough analogy. But um, you know, they're deciding now whether to take them out or not because you know some. Women are dressing up as superheroes and walking around without shirts and having pictures taken with tourists, which is is fine for the probably the guys, but not for the <laughs> for, for a lot of the parents. But but the point is that the city planned for that. It obviously it became a collecting point for people, and and things happen. All these different economic and right. social dynamics, most of which have been positive for New Yorkers. I mean, for for the city. Um, but when we get to the the other communities of the world, the ones you and I go out and work with, um, can they expect that this can happen just organically or or does it need to be carefully planned or is there a balance on this? There's, there is a balance. I, I think it, it in every community it certainly helps if the civic leaders are behind the effort. Uh, a lot of it can happen the bo bottom up and also the civic leaders un need to understand this is never going to be a 100% top down yeah. plan that's going to uh, come about in the way they envision. New York is a great example for that, by the way. This is probably, in theory, the most planned top-down city in the world, or at least in America. Um, and, and the reality is that so much of its actual growth and energy comes from the bottom up. It comes from people getting together. Uh, it comes from the, the whole artist district or, and then final revival of industrial Brooklyn, for example, was actually in violation of all the zoning laws for years until the city government finally realized, hey, these people are actually doing what something successful. Why should we be penalizing them for it? Uh, even in even in the, uh, the high tech industry, which has grown up, um, that's also been organic. As long as people have their connectivity, then they started finding each other. Yeah. And the city government didn't even know about this until it was such a huge event that there were more than a thousand people meeting every single month. Yeah. So I think that that public officials need to understand. Yeah. They have to be cheerleaders for it. There are things they can do to help move it forward, but ultimately, this will succeed and and grow in an organic way. Yeah, and again, what we talk about is unlocking that that raw, endless natural resource that doesn't pollute the air or dirty the water, which is human intelligence. So if you if you create the right conditions for that social mashup, 
all a, a lot of different things will flourish from it. A lot of them you can't you can't predict, you can't connect, but you it's kind of like you know it when you see it, and it's and it's really really fun to be around that when it's working well. The um, well, also you shouldn't be doing things that will stop it from happening, which is unfortunately oftentimes what government does end up doing. Yeah, well, that, that's a great. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Well, well, let's go into that because we're you know we're around an election period, right? And you know we know that in some cases when a new uh, mayor or city council gets elected and it's the other party and there's been a tough fight. Uh, they will just throw out everything, including some of the the broadband plans, the intelligent and smart city initiatives that have been underway, and really choke off a lot of the progress. How can the community plan for true sustainability, true sustainability being it survives the political climates that will come and go over the next two decades when these things have to start playing themselves out? Well, I mean, you you were yeah, CIO. I've seen, I've, that's right. Yeah. I've, I've had experience in government, and I can tell you. I mean, you know, I mean, partly they don't. Some of these leaders don't understand the importance of what we're talking about, uh, because again, they're they're talking to the winners of the old industrial economic game, not what's going on now. But from a community point of view, I think it's important that any one of these projects, if you really want to build an intelligent community, it's got to be more than just the government. Uh, there have to be a variety of other leading institutions, and frankly, not just institutions, but, but grassroots people who will keep it going and have the energy uh, yeah. to keep it going no matter what happens with an election. Uh, and, and frankly, most politicians... If they see there's a large segment of the community that's behind something, they're not going to fight it. They may not do much to help it, but they're certainly not going to fight it, which is fine. What, what's what's the sort of proper mix of critical mass? Is it uh, the university sector, some of the more significant private sector players in the community, the the churches? Who who do you? Well, uh, there, is there a right mix, or have you seen one? In one uh, of those? Uh, um, yeah, I, I actually I think it's all of those plus. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the triple helix, as it's called. You know, yeah. you've got the private sector and universities and the government. But, it, uh, you know, even that is fairly limited. Those folks are actually used to talking to each other and they kind of have a consensus view of the world, which may not actually be what you need for an intelligent community. Uh, where I've seen it been more successful, it has, and depending upon the community, has included the churches. It's included a lot of other nonprofit groups. And as I said, it's included individuals yeah. who have an interest in this. Um, and, and even associations of small businesses or entrepreneurs who are normally uh, given access to the doors of power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was just out in Columbus, Ohio, which was our Intelligent Community of the Year, and everything really began to spike there. I mean, the CIO you know, had put together a, a robust series of three broadband network providers. Um, there was a lot going on, but it, it really wasn't until Ohio State and Columbus State College and some of the other universities began to step into this nationwide hospital that you really saw the intelligent community of, of this uh, city flourish and jobs get created and, and real planning come together, neighborhoods start to emerge. Well, uh, I don't set the model. Yeah, I, yeah I don't, but I'd add beyond that, though. It, um, what helped that emergence was the development of a very entrepreneurial community in the whole region yeah. that worked with each other. And, and the willingness of the mayor to understand that it's not just the big businesses he talks to that help drive that growth, but also all these smaller uh, new businesses. And, and he was very supportive of that, which really mm -hmm. helped. Yeah, and he did some interesting things, too. He, you know, there's an area there called Franklinton, which is an older part of the city. And that was sort of just kind of coming up like the Soho or Tribeca in New York. And he, as you say, he didn't get in the way of it. But he did everything that a city could do to make that the arts district continue to develop and grow. And what you again then see is this unleashing of, of creative activity and power. I have a friend who's an architect. He moved his space down there. And, right. and you're seeing that. Exactly. And this is, by the way, I mean, you know, we talk about it as an arts district, but this is really a creative district. It's yeah. not, you know, it's not just people painting and doing sculpture. I mean, these are people who are being creative in business ways as entrepreneurs uh, or in other kinds of ways. So uh, you need to understand that this is uh, something that goes beyond the traditional idea. Oh, we're going to have a couple of laws for artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 that of course, getting back to this idea of the nonlinear or, or the quantum community, um, creativity. I mean, IBM does this study what four or five years ago, where they asked fifteen hundred CEOs what the number one core competency would be that they'd be looking for in their managers, and they came back and found that it was creativity. 
So it, it isn't just you know refurbishing your museum so you can get more tourists in, right? Right. This is, this is an economic uh, raw material. Right. Exactly. Yes. I mean, do you want the next Google to be in your backyard? Well, actually, some people don't, but <laughs> but it certainly, do you want to have that kind of economic growth? Uh, right. You know, right. and and it happens uh, from a uh, couple people you never heard of who end up uh, hitting on an idea that becomes very successful. Yeah. So so what does that mean in terms of uh, the educational system, Norm? Because, again, now we're, we're talking about a whole different approach to getting workers and people ready for this new community, this new economy. Well, as you know, I've been involved with libraries, and I think that that's very important. Yeah. I think the educational systems, I mean, they, they've done uh, an awful lot, but a lot of people are not in the educational system. Uh, there are adults. Uh, they're working. They're doing things. And, and they st also need to be able to be in that stream of new ideas, and that's where the library comes in. And some of the most successful cities uh, have uh, really used that library as a place where entrepreneurs can gather and learn and almost use the reference librarians as their, their corporate reference librarians because they can't afford to have their own. Uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is one of our top seven a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. is a good example of that where they took the whole fourth floor of their main library and turned it into an entrepreneurial space. Yeah, and of course libraries, uh, as you know from, from our work with uh, the Metro New York Library Council, is... Uh, is a great place to continue to erode the digital divide. Yes, that's true too. It plays a role in that as well. But the digital divide is not just a question of poor people who don't have access to the internet. Uh, it's all kinds of people who need to understand how to navigate through the internet. Mm -hmm. Or as I say with entrepreneurs, it's people who just need help finding quickly what they need to know so they can uh, rush to business opportunities. Right. So does that, I mean, so again, when you start talking about planning, you know, from revolution to renaissance, um, how, how does how should school districts and those who are planning these systems be looking at the mix of technology and creativity? What, what, well, well, what first, would you advise them? First of, all, first of all, I think that the, the, the mayors and the governors, and they, they need to understand we're in a knowledge economy now. So that anything that helps improve the knowledge and skills of their residents is going to improve the economy. And they need to look at all the institutions they have that can help people learn better. That includes the schools, the universities, uh, the libraries. I'm also a trustee of a community college, and and you know traditionally community colleges are all about preparing young people for their you know third and fourth year of uh, four year college. Uh, you know now the major job often is actually preparing adults who aren't going to be in a full fledged you know degree program, but really need that community college to learn things. So there's that whole range of things that that could, should be done to help your residents in a city gain the skills they need uh, to flourish in this knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. you know, so President Obama's on to something there with the Community College Initiative uh, in the United States here. Um, we also have uh, a saying at ICF, uh, which is the middle of nowhere is no more. Ah, uh, yes. And uh, um, you tired of hearing that yet? Uh, no, I think it's a great phrase. I say it every time. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, one of the things that you know, you have uh, taken on here is what we call the rural imperative. And very simply stated, we just had this this really, really big idea, crazy idea, some people said, of doing something about this migration of people into cities, which we all agree is going to be sustainable no matter how much, quote, smart technology you put into these places. It'll be the social consequences of the places left behind, social consequences of the places where people arrive. It just can't work. Uh, I, that is our core belief. But even if it does kind of work, isn't it best if people want to stay home and not simply be economic refugees if they want to? Our answer, you know, your answer was yes. So you've led our Connected Countryside Initiative, which is which is part of the rural imperative, which again is designed to look at place, small place, smaller place, and develop a program and a vision for effectively keeping people home in the countryside yes. in, or rural economies. Uh, you have this phrase called the virtual metropolis, which I, I just love. And it, it goes to some of the work you were doing at Cisco when you were there as well. But just uh, you know, talk about it a little bit. 
So, so I, I think, you know, first of all, I, I try to look at this thing uh, very positively, that there's a new opportunity. Uh, you know, you obviously can focus in on all of the, the destruction of the countryside and the problems that are there. But I think in this world in which there is no place that's nowhere anymore, uh, that you're all, you can be connected, uh, under those circumstances, uh, you, you can take advantage of anything uh, in the countryside that you might have uh, in, in the biggest cities. Uh, you have access to educational opportunities, to economic opportunities, to even advanced health care with telemedicine. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do that really makes life viable now in the countryside in the way that it wasn't in the last 50 years. Um, and so what we're trying to do is help people understand what the potential is and how they can take advantage of it. So one of the things I point out is how did cities grow? Uh, because they, they grew because you needed to have people near each other, talking to each other, to collaborate on new products and ideas, and, and it gave that kind of scale. With broadband today, you can build that kind of scale virtually. So you can connect millions of people. The 60 million people in the U.S. alone who live in, in small communities in the countryside uh, can become a virtual metropolis, which would be u bigger than anything else that's around if they can just connect themselves together. And so in New York City, I might walk, you know, meet somebody taking the subway uh, to have a conversation. Um, in this 21st century, I can do the same thing by having a video conference with somebody in another small town and each of us contributes something so we can help each other out to uh, be a success. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really, that's the kind of thing that I said earlier, you, you got to think about yourself now as a global player and the opportunities that that opens up. And one of the major ones is for all these small towns to agglomerate themselves, to put themselves together in this virtual metropolis and they can have the scale and the impact that the big city metropolises have had. Yeah, and, and again, that's that's just taking advantage of critical mass to do certain things, again, that, that is enabled when you have density. Yeah, I have um, an example. Right? I mean, was, let's say I've got a great new idea. I've you know, got an engineering skill. There are plenty of people actually who know, know how to do all kinds of things who live in the countryside. But, you know, they don't know how to make a business out of that. So, you know, if I'm in a small town, there may be, if I'm lucky, somebody who's got marketing skills and understands how to do this kind of thing. But if I'm in a virtual metropolis of small towns, the chances that I'll find somebody who knows how to do this, you know, become almost 100%. Um, so it's not so, – so it's because of that scale and the reach that I now have that will give me access to all the people I need to succeed. Yeah, I just love that idea. But, but I, you know, I guess the question would be on the other side of it. Uh, is it – Norm, is it real density? Is it the same kind of density you and I experience when we have a cup of coffee in Manhattan here? Not yet. And, and this is something that I think is important, and I try to tell people, uh, you know, civic leaders and even people involved with these projects, is we're still in a transition. Uh, you know, there, there's sort of two different ways I sort of, you know, uh, try to talk about this. One is if you think about where we are with telephones today, the Internet is somewhere like where telephones were in 1920. Yeah, mm -hmm. you could make long-distance calls and things like that, but it wasn't the same as what we're doing now. Um, and they even had marine, you know, radio calls, you know, from ships. It wasn't the same thing as the easy cell smartphone use that we have now. So we have a lot to change yet. Um, and, and so one of the things that I suggest to people is when we actually start getting video, which is very important because now you're talking about face-to-face, -face, fuller communication. When you start getting casual video conferencing over the Internet for people, then, yes, it will be very much like having uh, the two of us sit down at a coffee shop. But right now, we're still in the stage where most of our interpersonal communications are dominated by text, and it's not sufficient to uh, have those yeah. kind of sparks that happen between people and that trust that happens between people yeah. when they see each other. It'll be interesting to see how that happens, how, yeah. that, how that plays it's out. It's going to happen sooner than people expect. I, you know, certainly yeah, I bet. With, within, ten I bet. Years, within 10 years or so, um, I certainly expect to see that. That's and that's when the impact of the internet and broadband are going to really hit, and it's going to take people by surprise to said, "Yeah, I have live with this. I think I know how to deal with this." And it turns out, no, they don't. They're still, <laughs> they're still. Uh, the way I describe it is, they're still in the horseless carriage stage. You're right. We're still. Uh, it's when, the party when, line systems. Uh, when, 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 yeah, when, 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 when cars first came out. They called them horseless carriages because that's how they were thinking about them. It only it took a couple of decades later for people to realize this thing we call an automobile is something different. It has implications that are different. It requires a highway system yep. and it allows for the development of suburbia in a different way. That's when they all of a sudden it hit them that this invention had a major impact. And I think we're not there yet with broadband and the internet. 
No, I, I agree, and that's that's well said. I think, um, but the new connected countryside is happening. I mean, absolutely, we, see it, we yes. see it places. We see it out near our institute in Mississippi that where we're starting to go out and see what broadband is doing in those communities. So it it, it is a a fact. Planners of rural and uh, countryside communities in places are embracing it as part of their planning, right? Absolutely. And in fact, what's interesting is that you can see the value of the kinds of things that ICF talks about in smaller communities much faster than in bigger communities. Uh, and mm -hmm. the, the difference between the communities who are adopting the intelligent community approach uh, and those who aren't is really dramatic. Uh, the, the ones who aren't are suffering. The ones who are find the incomes going up by two-thirds. Uh, and there are all kinds of opportunities that are happening for their people. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's unfortunately they're still in, in the minority of such communities, but it's 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 just wonderful to see. And these people are happy because they love the lifestyle. They wanted to be in these small towns. That's why they were there or moved there. Um, and now they can be there and have all the uh, advantages of being part of the modern world. Yep, quality of life is yep. capital. We see that in Mitchell, South Dakota. I mean, they're yep. they're kind of a metropolis to some of the other smaller places. So there's 16,000, but 2.8, <laughs> right? 2.8% unemployment. Right. You can fish. I mean, you know, the walleye out there, the bison. It is, it is really a beautiful place, but it's very cosmopolitan now. And that's, I suspect we'll see more of that. Yes. Yeah, now, I just want to put a plug. We Our Connected Countryside Project is on Indiegogo. So folks are contributing to that so that we can have our uh, new Connected Countryside uh, event, which is a virtual event. So... Um, yeah, we wanted we wanted we wanted to get all these communities together to help them learn from each other and start working with each other to begin building this virtual metropolis. We also wanted to prove the point that if you actually you can actually create a global connection among all these small towns, uh, and that's what the uh, the virtual summit is going to be about. And we hope people will contribute. It doesn't cost a lot of money, but we do need help to get it off the ground. Yeah, it doesn't cost a lot, but we do need help. And and it's again, it's it's similar to what we've achieved on the other side, where we've now got 134 cities. Uh, working together from all different parts of the world as intelligent communities. And what's interesting there, Norm, is that in many cases, an Eindhoven in Holland will look at its fellow intelligent community in Taiwan and have more in common with them than it might somebody, you know, a couple hundred meters away in Holland because of the like-mindedness of it, right? That's right. That's right, because they, they actually share a common outlook. Uh, not that they can help each other a lot more. Uh, you know, if I, uh, I'm using economic development as, as an example. Uh, if I'm uh, in Canada, for example, and I want to be able to sell my services or products in Europe, uh, there's nothing better in the world than having somebody in the heart of Europe who can be uh, work for me and do that same thing. And, and in reverse, I can help them sell in North America. Yep. So that's the message we're trying to get across. Uh, Dr. Norman Jackness, thank you so much for uh being a part of this, and uh, now we can go get a cup of coffee. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope ICF keeps up the great work they've been doing. This is uh, people don't realize you've been around 15 years. You were talking about this stuff before anybody else was. Yeah, well, you were right there with us. Thanks, Norm. Thank you. Bye bye.